Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for braving the rain and uh, joining us for uh, our third book event of, uh, since I've been director of the Bedrosian Center. I'm Raphael Bostic, a professor here at the Price School, and I'm very pleased to be able to uh, have you here to, to have a conversation with Ed Kleinbard from the law school. Um, this book is, is actually about something that uh, we've been talking about a fair amount through the course of the semester, which is federal government spending, uh, how should a tax system work, and what are the implications for welfare. In the summer, uh, we had a, uh, a Bedrosian Book Club podcast on the Piketty book, Tomas Piketty's uh, Capital in the 21st Century. That has a lot of uh, reflections on the role of taxation and, and what government's role is in shaping welfare for families and for individuals. So this is very much in that spirit. I'm sure many things will come up, and uh, I'm very excited to do this. I'm excited for a couple of reasons. The tax stuff is one. Uh, another is that this does represent uh, a cross-university uh, enterprise. Right? So I was talking to Professor Kleinbard earlier that um, there are very, very few people who know uh, all the things that are going on around campus. And I think there are very few people in our school that are really aware of, of the things, interesting things going on uh, in the law school. So I'm glad to be able to lift up some of that and, uh, and make it accessible to a broader audience. And this is really good. So let me give Ed a formal introduction. Uh, he's the Ividel and Theodore Johnson Professor of Law and Business here at USC. He is at the Gould School of Law uh, and a fellow at the Century Foundation. He got here in 2009. Uh, and before that, he had the good fortune or misfortune, depending on your perspective, uh, to work in Congress. And he was a chief of staff uh, for the Joint Committee on Taxation, so was very much uh, in the weeds of making our tax laws and understanding how it all works. Um, that can be interesting. Sometimes seeing the sausage is not really what you want to do. Um, uh, but uh, his work focuses on uh, taxation of capital income, international tax issues, and the political economy of tax taxation. Uh, he's got lots of papers in many law reviews and tax notes. He's uh, one of the leading thinkers on tax policy uh, in the country. And I'm really just uh, pleased as punch to have you here uh, under the Bedrosian banner to talk about your book. The book is, We Are Better Than This. Um, and the subtitle is How Government Should Spend Our Money. Um, if you, we will be around after. Uh, so Ed can sign it if you want to get a copy of the book. Uh, but I actually like this title and because, because people complain a lot, right? They, I think it seems like this is what everyone is saying, uh, but we don't hear many prescriptions on how to actually do it. So I'm looking forward to hearing you. Thank you very much. Thank all of you for coming uh, on this uncharacteristically dreary day. Uh, uh, let me, um, let me try and set uh, the stage a bit. The book is long, and the book uh, is uh, ambitious. Raphael, by the way, mis uh, 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 misread the title. The title is not We Are Better Than This. The title is We Are Better Than This. Uh, <laughs> and the, um, uh, uh, it's an ambitious book uh, because it's aimed simultaneously at uh, well-educated lay readers and at academics. For the well-educated lay reader, there's simply a lot of information there about how budgets are constructed, how uh, uh, tax, uh, some of the elements of tax policy, uh, you know, the standard chestnuts like the incidence of the corporate income tax, things like that. Uh, there's a prescription for a better uh, tax uh, regime called the Better Base Case uh, with some novel ideas in particular on the taxation of capital income, but most importantly, it's about reorienting thinking um, uh, and encouraging people to understand uh, that government, in fact, uh, is not the same as taking your money and putting it in a pile and setting it on fire. Um, that there are, the government is useful, the government can ha play a complementary role to the private sector that doesn't necessarily compete with the private sector. Um, uh, and uh, to understand some of the uh, intersections between spending policy on the one hand <coughs> and some of our standard, so, some of our large problems that confront us today, including particular inequality 
uh, on the other. From the point of view of uh, academic uh, audience, uh, uh, it, the book uh, uh, really tries to bring the public finance community and the tax law community to bring them up short and say, you know, uh, we've um, uh, gotten ourselves into a bit of a corner here. We uh, uh, use terms like redistribution in a cavalier sort of way without thinking through uh, the normative implications of words like that, and we therefore allow our work to be characterized unconsciously or, or consciously um, through that. We use general equilibrium models in, that assume that government spending has no investment component. Uh, we model uh, or, or describe the uh, distribution of tax liabilities across the income uh, spectrum of the population, when what we should be focusing on is the net effect of fiscal policy, the combination of spending and taxing. And so the book is all about a reorienting thinking um, uh, for both audiences. In one, one case, a lot of information. In the other case, uh, uh, some research, some original research, and a lot of reprimands. Uh, the book has the tone uh, of a very minor Old Testament prophet who's pissed off about having been left out of the Old Testament. It's sort of, <laughs> sort of the tone of the book. Uh, so uh, uh, the book has a moral, um, uh, th th there are two, two areas in which I'm very weak. One of them is economics and the other is uh, philosophy. And so the book is a combination of economics and philosophy. Uh, but we have no choice because it turns out that in fact, um, uh, when you think about the role of government in spending and taxing, fiscal policy in the broad sense, uh, it has obviously, they're very uh, large and important economic lessons that we can draw, particularly on the tax side. And I argue that that field is actually pretty well filled out from the point of view of what we need for, for government work. I'm not suggesting there's no, no room for any more PhD candidates, but uh, from the point of view of getting on with the business of government, we actually know a, a fair amount. Uh, but um, uh, what we don't know very much about uh, are the returns to spending, where there is very li relatively little work done, uh, and very little work done on the net fiscal system of the United States, the net of spending and taxing. So there are lots of, of research opportunities there. The, the book has one thing in common with Thomas Piketty. I mean, he, he's a real economist. I'm not, but they, they're both political economy narratives. And I think that's just great. Uh, uh, obviously, I have every reason to fasten myself to the coattails of to, uh, Thomas Piketty. But uh, the fact that uh, we are bringing back into the fold old-fashioned political economy narratives, I think, is actually quite important. Uh, Thomas Piketty is a much better uh, economist than I will ever be. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, I'm a very highly trained lawyer, and I frankly have better advocacy skills. Uh, and so the book has uh, some reasonable uh, prescriptions and argues for them, I think, uh, relatively <coughs> persuasively. So, the, 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 so what's the idea? The idea of the book is uh, that, in fact, we need, the United States of America needs a more muscular government. Uh, and it does, uh, uh, notwithstanding the fact that government always struggles to do its job well. Peter Schuck, uh, with whom I discussed the things at Brookings a couple of weeks ago, has a book about the many failings of government. One of the great things about government is its failings are quite transparent. You know, that's the great thing about a democracy. Uh, the failings of corporate America are hidden behind the curtain uh, until we have a crisis. So uh, yes, we have lots of instances, lots of anecdotes of government failure, but that doesn't mean uh, that we should conclude from that that there's nothing useful for government to do in our lives. The book argues exactly the opposite. It means that it's worth the effort. If you get through the end of the book, it's worth the effort to try and overcome some of those obstacles that people like Peter have identified for government to do well, because they're real payoffs. And the payoffs of muscular government, first, it's simply desirable because, in fact, it en enhances uh, uh, our economic welfare in, a very, in, the, in the most straightforward sense of the world. The pie gets bigger because government investment turns out, if well designed, to be complementary to the private sector. Second, uh, it's absolutely necessary if we in fact are going to honor some of the fundamental principles that, that we all um, uh, claim 
uh, are central to uh, the American enterprise, uh, and that in particular is equality of opportunity. Uh, there is no equality of opportunity in the real world without a muscular government. Uh, and finally, it's responsive to the most important socioeconomic issue of our time, which is the uh, growing income and wealth inequality. So uh, let's take those a little bit um, uh, more depth. Uh, it's desirable as, uh, uh, to imagine a more muscular government because government investment and government insurance, uh, if well designed, are complementary to uh, private markets. Private markets are necessarily incomplete in major fundamental ways. And the book's, uh, one of the book's core arguments is that we systematically underestimate the incompleteness of the private markets uh, and simultaneously underestimate the highly contingent nature of our lives. One of the great, uh, really interesting things about having worked for Wall Street for 30 years is in the course of 30 years, I met one person who acknowledged that he had been lucky. Everybody else was rich because he was uniquely talented, gifted, and brilliant, and ruthless, um, and luck had nothing to do with it. Uh, so the contingent nature of our lives is something that turns out that um, private markets can't adequately insure against. Uh, uh, it's necessary because uh, we're not going to find private market solutions to, to the kinds of investments in ourselves that are, necess that are required uh, in order to honor equality of opportunity. Uh, and it's responsive uh, because it turns out that we've made a fundamental mistake in um, our uh, framing of tax and fiscal policy debates, which is to, in this country, to obsess over the progressive income tax when in fact what we should be focusing on is do we have a progressive fiscal system? And as we'll see in a few minutes, it turns out those are two very different things. And regressive taxes fund net progressive fiscal systems if you know what you're doing. So uh, just as a reminder, of course governments regulate and reg government regulation is extremely important. The book's just not about that topic. It's about fiscal policy. And when you're talking about fiscal policy, contrary to the way we often debate issues uh, you know, throughout the blog sphere, throughout the media, uh, the purpose of government is not to take money away from us through taxation, it's to spend money. And taxing is simply the way we finance the spending. And the question is, is that spending purposive? Um, uh, uh, government investment, it turns out, throws off large positive economic returns in the narrowest sense, just return on the investment sense. It throws off large uh, welfare benefits. Um, uh, uh, construction jobs, for example, create uh, uh, honorable way, modes of work, because not everybody in the United States is going to invent Snapchat. Uh, there's a limited number of apps that we need, and we don't need 100 million of them. Uh, and uh, I believe that Americans define themselves, one of the unique characteristics of America is that we define ourselves through work. And so if you want to say, what can I do to enhance welfare in the broadest sense, it's where can I have, find good quality, dignified jobs for wide uh, numbers of Americans. Uh, investment in ourselves, in infrastructure, for example, has both the narrow financial returns and also these larger economic returns. And of course, government insurance programs uh, align with um, standard insurance theory, uh, uh, particularly the problems of adverse selection that otherwise plague um, uh, lots of uh, insurance, including health insurance, uh, and are responsive to the really fundamentally contingent nature of our lives. Very few people in this room chose your parents for example. Um, uh, I, God knows if I had a choice, I wouldn't have chosen my mother. And uh, uh, the, uh, uh, b because life itself is so fundamentally contingent, uh, we need to ask ourselves the question, how much do we want uh, to use insurance mechanisms to mitigate those contingencies? That's the kind of question we should be debating. So. Uh, we put the cart before the horse in the sense that we debate tax policy, end, tax policy endlessly. And that's just fundamentally stupid. You know? uh, that's like having an argument about uh, whether it's better to issue medium-term notes or long-term bonds. Uh, the question is, what are you going to do with the money? What, is, what are you trying to finance here? 
Uh, and instead, we ask ourselves the question over and over uh, in um, our, our uh, discussions um, and even in academic papers. So in effect, we ask ourselves, uh, how much pain would, we, would you like today in the form of more taxes? And the answer is not very much, please. And the right question is not uh, how much pain uh, would you like to suffer, but what opportunities are there? What is the opportunity cost of not pursuing some uh, of the uh, investment and insurance opportunities that are most aptly the province uh, of government? Uh, and therefore, what are the opportunities net of the cost? Of course, there's deadweight loss to taxation. The book explains that for people who aren't familiar with terms like deadweight loss. But uh, of course, there's, there, there are costs to taxation, but there are also opportunity costs for not pursuing productive uh, investment opportunities. So um, can we go? Thanks. So let me give you one quick example. Uh, the largest investment class in the United States, you want to think about it in, in sort of finance terms, the largest uh, investment class in the United States is us, ourselves. Two thirds of American uh, of national income is labor income. Uh, so our largest asset class is really uh, ourselves. And our, it, it's absolutely clear from the research that our lifetime incomes and our lifetime satisfactions are tied directly to how much we invest in ourselves, principally through education. And uh, the country gets richer as we invest more in ourselves, uh, obviously. So uh, from a, uh, just of, uh, a sense of uh, national income, the, m the more we can productively invest in ourselves, the larger the pie gets. In addition, if you care about equality of opportunity, uh, it, you have to acknowledge uh, that um, you need to find a mechanism to make at least roughly comparable investments in comparably able kids, regardless uh, of the wealth of their parents. Uh, and it turns out that that is some, a function that private markets cannot uh, provide. Uh, that doesn't mean that there's only one way to run public education. You know, my son and daughter-in-law are part of the charter school com community. So, you know, I've, got, I've staked out or had staked out for me a position there. There are lots of different ways of doing public education. But the fact is, uh, there is no substitute for the uh, public uh, uh, provision uh, of uh, educational opportunities. So, but here are the facts. It, 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 it's clear that, that investment in ourselves uh, is critical to future economic growth uh, and uh, to equality of opportunity. But the actual facts, there's a direct uh, relationship between uh, school test scores and median home prices, uh, uh, which is to say that rich cluster in an area, rich can afford, uh, the rich pay for better schools, uh, and rich kids, uh, and I resist here and find distasteful beyond belief, the claims of Greg Mankiw, who says, well, uh, that uh, the children of the affluent are inherently smarter because we're affluent because we were smart, and therefore our smart genes got in, uh, get inherited, and that's the only explanation for why smart, why kids of the affluent do better on, on standardized test scores. Profoundly distasteful, and distasteful to me that uh, uh, economists have not called him out more directly on, on statements like that. I don't make this stuff up, by the way. There's, there's you know, hundreds and hundreds of sites in the book. The top quintile spends seven times as much as the bottom quintile, as you'd expect, on enrichment in education. This is not private schools. Uh, this is just enrichment. This is flute lessons. Uh, and you know, uh, for those of you uh, who have children and you're trying to get them in, into good college, uh, uh, you all know that the easiest way to do that is for them to become proficient at the viola de gamba uh, or something like that. Those are, those are attributes uh, of the uh, that the rich can enjoy, uh, and in doing so, inequality, which we think of as a personal characteristics, becomes like a gene. Inequality becomes like a gene precisely for these reasons, that private resources finance higher levels of investment in our kids. Uh, the academic achievement gap which, uh, between rich and poor is 30 to 40 percent higher, greater today than it was 20 years ago. So in the space of two decades, uh, children of the affluent have pulled further ahead uh, by virtue of disproportionately greater investments that are being made by private resources to wit their parents. Uh, and it turns out 
that when you take, you take a step back and say, how can all this be true in the United States of America? We're one of four countries in the OECD uh, that uh, systematically spends more on the public education of rich kids than on poor kids. A bizarre and plainly perverse, plainly perverse policy to spend systematically more on educating rich kids than poor kids. Uh, yet we're one of four countries in the OECD that does that. I mean, you know, if you want to be um, uh, 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 on equal t uh, footing with Slovenia and Turkey, be my guess. The point of the book is, in fact, we can do better than that. Uh, and similarly, graduating students with uh, uh, 140, $150,000 of debt, which is the kind of numbers that the kids graduating from my law school now, now leave school with. Uh, um, uh, American uh, students are frequently flabbergasted to learn that university in Germany, for example, is free or nearly free, and, and similarly in France. Uh, so that we, um, the idea that it's natural and normal to graduate college or graduate professional school with debt that itself is opportunity throttling because we cannot pursue um, high risk uh, uh, opportunities we can't, or, and we cannot pursue low financial reward opportunities simply because, by virtue of the debt uh, the, that, that is, uh, hangs around our net. Our neck, that is not normal, it is not necessary. It is, there are other ways of organizing our relationships with each other. So again, government is not a zero sum game. This is the critical point that in, you, there, there's a limited amount of work that's been done, but that work that has been done shows very large financial payoffs to infrastructure investment, for example. Eight or 10% per, per annum returns on money. At a time when government can borrow at two and three percent, and uh, for investments yielding eight and ten percent, you would think we would be doing a lot of that, and instead, of course, um, uh, we're doing less. And similarly, the term redistribution, which we use so cavalierly in the academy, the term redistribution is itself a loaded term. It creates it, 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 uh, a presumption uh, uh, of correctness to to baseline market distributions in the first place. But more important from the point of view of the book, uh, uh, it ignores the fact that the pie gets bigger. So we're not redistributing when we tax and invest. We're in fact investing and growing a bigger pie. And the question is how will that invest, the returns on that investment be shared? So uh, the book uh, says mean things about lots of well-known people. Basically, anybody who's won a Nobel Prize uh, in the last 20 years in economics, I say mean, uh, mean things about um, in respect of one, because they, they keep leading with their chin and making and, and saying outrageous, outrageous things. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, private markets are great. Uh, but the fact is that the market triumphalist, that's the term the book used, the market triumphalist worldview um, is simplistic in positing perfect markets all the time. The George Stigler worldview uh, has, I think, a limited amount of utility uh, uh, inside the academy. It is highly susceptible uh, uh, of misuse uh, outside the academy, and even within the academy, it tends to throttle the kinds of useful research projects. Uh, it, it, it's always delivered in this terribly condescending and pay, oh, Ed, if only you understood the iron laws of economics, you would see that you have no choice for you to be poor and me to be rich. It's just the way the world works. Uh, and in fact, that's not true. Um, uh, and the policy lessons that, that are drawn from the market triumphalist worldview um, uh, and that are frequently trumpeted by very well-known household name economists, all, all of them angling to be the next uh, 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 chairman of the, of the Fed uh, in a Republican administration, are um, uh, uh, describing policy solutions for a world that simply does not exist. And most interestingly, because we tend to forget this, it's also extraordinarily immature in its political philosophy. The reason for it's the political success is that it has joined at the hip the idea that marketplace freedoms and political liberties necessarily have to, have to move in tandem. And so that any restriction uh, uh, on marketplace freedom or any 
uh, introduction of complementary work by government to, f to round out the marketplace is necessarily um, a restriction of political liberties. That is a false and juvenile political philosophy. Uh, you can have a, a vibrant and functioning democracy uh, in a world that has much more constrained ideas of the, of the utility of the private markets uh, and a much higher estimation in turn of, um, of what public markets, of what the public uh, sector can do. Uh, Nordics, Germany, these are all examples of countries that are functioning democracies in which political liberty is honored, but in which we don't uh, uh, insist that marketplace, absolute marketplace freedom and political liberty are the same thing. The growth fairy is uh, sort of unique to my field. Uh, the growth fairy, of course, is this idea that um, uh, economic growth is a wonderful thing. Well, who's going to argue the, the contrary? But you always have to begin by you know, stating the obvious as if it was a profound truth. Economic growth is a, is a, is a wonderful thing. And um, in order to obtain economic growth, we have to attract the benevolent attention of the growth fairy. The growth fairy is always hovering in a distance because she only sups on one form of nectar, uh, which is uh, tax cuts. And whatever the tax rate is, it's, not, it's too high. Uh, and therefore, if only we were to cut taxes just a little bit more, then the growth fairy would shower her blessings on us. Then we would have economic growth. Uh, and uh, there are many, many uh, sh shortcomings to the growth fairy um, mythology, one of the many of which that's directly relevant here uh, is that it overlooks the returns to the spending that must be cut in order to obtain uh, the tax uh, cuts on, that uh, it purports to drive uh, the future. Uh, so um, again, a topic that none of us likes very much, because we like to think that we're in control of everything in our lives and ourselves, uh, and it gives us great satisfaction to think that we did it all ourselves. Uh, but the fact is luck, that our outcomes are highly contingent. Uh, our health, our accidents, whether good or bad, the fortuities that occur to us, uh, uh, all these change our outcomes uh, in ways we simply do not control. And most fundamentally, we don't control the life into which we are born. Uh, the market triumphalist worldview, uh, in a sense, to a large extent, ignores this and misreads market outcomes as efficient outcomes. Um, and in doing so, ignores the pervasive role of luck and it ignores the fact that government uh, insurance can mitigate the consequences of bad luck uh, and can do so in ways that private markets cannot, that are consistent with theories of, uh, you know, fundamental ins theories of insurance, in particular the problems of adverse selection. Uh, and I argue that government insurance can increase risk taking. In a world in which kids graduate university with no debt uh, and health care is a world in which kids can take risks and try things that they cannot. Um, if you go to any big Wall Street law firm, it is populated by deeply unhappy young associate lawyers who are there to pay off their debt. That's a profoundly sad way of organizing um, uh, our country. So um, um, uh, finally, it, you know, the, the book makes a lot of fun of uh, 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 so, some of the uh, uh, more uh, 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 outrageous statements of economists angling for jobs uh, in, in, you know, in the, in the uh, uh, next uh, Bush presidency. Um, but uh, the left gets it wrong too. Everybody gets it wrong. And the left gets it wrong through its bizarre uh, in, um, obsession with the progressive income tax, which has been a hallmark of the left's political agenda since uh, it pushed for the progressive income tax 100 years ago. Uh, well-designed public spending is progressive, and uh, steeply progressive income tax rates have real economic efficiency costs, which you know I absolutely subscribe to, deadweight loss. And they also create enormous political resistance because it turns out uh, that uh, that if you want to tax the rich, uh, there is a class of America who disagrees with this, uh, namely the rich, uh, and the result is political stasis. The secret is that we don't really need higher, um, more steeply progressive income tax rates 
to drive a more progressive fiscal outcomes. We just need a bigger <laughs> fiscal state. We need a bigger government and because the spending itself is so progressive and the spending dominates the taxing side. And regressive taxes end up funding progressive net fiscal system. That is the secret sauce of the Nordics or the secret sauce of Germany, for example. We don't have to be France. I mean, I happen to be a Francophile, but I'm not asking you all to become France. What the book asks for is that we spend 2% more of GDP than we spend today. Um, uh, uh, so 10% 10, 10 more larger government, not 100% larger government. The book phrases everything it can in economic terms because that is the lingua franca of debate today. But the book acknowledges uh, and uses Adam Smith uh, as a rhetorical device in doing so, throwing up the real Adam Smith um, in, to um, the cartoon version that, that we celebrate. Uh, the book uh, acknowledges and en encourages introspection on the idea that fiscal policy in the end is an exercise in applied moral philosophy as well as in economics, uh, and that it, what we choose to do for ourselves, the things we choose to do together through the medium of government uh, defines what the book calls our fiscal soul um, and tells a lot about what kind of country we really want to be as opposed to the easy slogans uh, that we might espouse. Uh, so uh, let me talk a little bit more about progressive taxes and progressive fiscal systems. Oh, this is the most important slide, I forgot. Uh, uh, this one's self-evident. Uh, uh, and <laughs> Um, so let me, I mean, does anybody, is anybody confused that the United States is the lowest tax jurisdiction in the OECD? The lowest tax as a percentage of GDP? I hope there's no one in this room who's confused by that. If you, shame on you if you are. We are the lowest tax country in the OECD, you know. Uh, we are also the most unequal in, ma in major ways. This is the, the ratio of the, of the top uh, dec decile to the bottom decile. Uh, in disposable income. This is after tax and after all transfer payments. That's what disposable income means. The United States, there's no country in, in the OECD that has the level of, um, um, well, there's none in this top 10. I think Chile is, uh, rivals us uh, in the <coughs> difference between rich and poor uh, within, within the country. Um, and uh, similarly, we accept more poverty than any other country in the OECD. Again, this is the OECD standard definition of poverty as 50% uh, below the median income level for the country uh, and using the working age population. Uh, uh, I can't help it. This, to me, this slide explains uh, all the anger in America. This is a slide showing the, the, the uh, labor income of working full time, um, uh, year-round male workers. And what you see is that that income has been flat for 40 years. It actually peaked in 1973. Full-time, year-round male workers, the median uh, has not budged in real terms in 40 years. It's actually slightly down. The household, the American household, has greater income entirely due to the second wage earner entering the workforce typically a woman in the household, entering the workforce, and for the wage gap, the pay gap uh, between male and female workers doing the same job to have narrowed somewhat. It's still disgraceful, but it's narrowed somewhat. That is the only thing that has driven household income uh, in the United States in the last 40 years. In many cases, that's a great thing, right? In many cases, that's wonderful new opportunities, but in other cases, it's the second wage earner entering the workforce because there is no choice, because uh, real wages uh, for the median male uh, worker have been flat for 40 years. Um, transfer programs, uh, I hope again no one's confused about, all of our transfer pro programs in the United States, uh, not all, but the vast bulk of, our, of them go to fund the old. And you want to think about a dumb investment you know, you don't get a lot of return on investment, keeping the old alive another year or two, right? You want to invest, Siri, you want, you want to invest in the machines while they're fresh and vital, right? You know, you want to invest in you and not, and not me, right? And yet we spend 70% um, of all transfer payments go to the elderly 
And indeed, the amount that goes to households with children has gone down over the last 30 years. So bizarre policy. A, 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 a so very large fraction of that is healthcare, is Medicare. Healthcare kids don't. Right. Therefore, put the f elderly on an ice floes and let's invest in the kids. <laughs> no, seriously, seriously. The point that was uh, you give, now that I'm um, now that I'm, I'm I sort of can appreciate the perspective of the elderly. Let me let me rephrase that. <laughs> so the the um, it's not that we're spending too much on the old. It's that we're not spending enough. Period. And that the and the, what's missing is what we should be spending on the young. If you look what we spend on the old compared to other countries, I don't, I don't have the chart with me, but it's in the book. If you look at what we spend on the old compared to what other countries spend on their elderly, we spend actually a little bit less as a percentage of GDP. We have a very wasteful um, form of, of public spending in the form of Medicare uh, because of our you know, bizarre notions that uh, the private market solutions must be best, and, and all the airsets, you know, uh, uh, consequences. The problem is not that we spend too much on the old; it's that we just don't spend enough. Period, and the missing spending is on the young. No, 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 no more questions. So, so, uh, <laughs> so I'm going to. Oh, uh, this, this is here. This, this, my point on infrastructure. Uh, this is uh, the percentage of GDP net, so net of depreciation that we spend on infrastructure. We're now at our all-time low since 1967. We used to spend about 3%, uh, then it percolated along around 1.5%, and now we're spending about 6 tenths of 1% on uh, net investment in infrastructure. Um, so I'm going to skip the stuff on inequality and rule out of order, anybody who's confused about that, um, um, and talk about uh, uh, I'll pick up here. Uh, the United States does very little by way of redistribution, you know, to use that odious term. Uh, here's the U.S. Uh, and Germany. Uh, the United States and Germany have comparable uh, market income genies. Do I need to explain? I'm glad to explain. Everyone's cool with these terms, right? So the United States and uh, uh, Germany have comparable market income genies, but look what happens when you look at disposable income. That's after tax and after transfers. The United States leaps ahead in, in remember, the higher the number, the more unequal. Leaps ahead in inequality after tax, after transfer than Germany. And that's, in effect, what I'm going to be talking about is why is that so? Um, and uh, uh, the numbers, uh, uh, just to, to make clear that the numbers are not being driven by differences in, in the uh, 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 age uh, uh, distribution uh, of the population. Here again is the United States and Germany. Now we we'll just look at working age, where uh, the United States ha has a bit more uh, baseline inequality uh, and um, uh, significantly more uh, disposable inequality. Our system is reducing among working age people, uh, market uh, income inequality by 18%, whereas Germany's is 28%. Even the UK does better than we do, you know, and they're in the hands of a lunatic. So um, the United States has a progressive tax, the most progressive income tax uh, in the OECD. When you measure that under the Kakwani uh, index, which basically asks the question, uh, how progressive is the tax system in the abstract without regard to the size of the tax system? The United States, by far the most progressive income tax. Uh, um, the, um, uh, that's the horizontal axis. Vertical axis is uh, the, the percentage reduction in Gini um, uh, after taxes and after transfers. There's very poor data on what I call um, um, the sort of indirect uh, government spending, which is about 40% of government spending that, that doesn't have somebody's name on the check. Uh, but the data that do exist, uh, the, OE, the CBO's first effort at answering that question, who benefits from general government spending, was a year ago. You know, this, which gives you a sense of how underdeveloped the area is. Uh, uh, the United States, very progressive income tax, but does nothing. The technical term used in public finance is we do bupkis to change the, the outcome. There's a Wikipedia page on English words of Yiddish origin for the, the, those of you who are having trouble following. So uh, uh, does 
almost nothing by comparison to other countries to change uh, 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 the um, income uh, uh, inequality. Uh, amazingly, there's almost no work that's been done trying to add up all the taxes. Because obviously, you know, your first instinct, well, in Europe, they rely a lot on consumption taxes. And, but of course, that makes exactly the point even more forcefully in the sense, and now unfortunately, I, I stole this from the only uh, source I've been able to find, Monica Prasad's uh, uh, paper, uh, uh, trying to add up all the taxes. And basically what they do is they look at each tax and say what, what percentage of total each kind of tax, what percentage of total tax revenues does that tax represent? And so they weight the genies uh, for each tax uh, accordingly. And they um, compare that not to uh, uh, after tax, after transfer payments, but to the Esping Anderson Decommodification Index, uh, which turns out when I gave a lecture at National Tax Association to all the public finance uh, uh, economists in the country confirmed what I suspected, which is nobody's ever heard of the Esping Anderson decommodification, and except Mr. By the way, it turns out this is not two people; it's only one person. It's Mr. Esping Anderson. That's um, uh, you're now an expert, uh, but basically it's a, it's a similar idea. Uh, it's basically a, a measure of how far removed you are from a pure market outcomes. Uh, and again, what you see uh, uh, that the United States does very little here. Being further to the left means closer to pure market outcomes. So um, we have a, a much more progressive system um, and a much uh, 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 less, uh, a much closer to pure market uh, outcomes. I'm going to skip all the nerdy notes. And so um, I'm going to anybody here is confused about progressive income tax, I'll take you outside and spank you later. Um, and um, um, just finish with a couple more slides. So what drives the, the answer? And the answer is it's spending. And so what, um, uh, what this chart uh, is showing is, um, uh, again, uh, the horizontal axis is, uh, is the redistributive impact uh, of transfers. The horizontal, uh, sorry, the vertical axis, the y-axis, is um, the, in, the uh, impact of taxes. And so uh, uh, this, is supposed, this is a 45 degree line. So the United States relies about equally on transfer payments uh, and taxes as, the, as its uh, drivers of uh, income inequality remediation. All the countries that do more are doing it on the spending side, not on the taxing side. They're not higher up vertically, they're further over this way. They're using, they're using the spending side um, uh, more. Um, and, uh, um, Final couple slides, regressive taxes fund progressive systems. Just to make this point forcefully, here's the United States. This is Kakwani index of progressivity. This is zero. United States, by far the most progressive income tax. Again, we don't have good data on all taxes combined other than one Monica Prasad uh, paper, uh, at least that I found. Uh, um, vertically uh, is, again, the, the, the effects uh, of uh, 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 taxes and transfers on uh, mitigating inequality. Germany is way up here. Less progressive system, a regressive system, in fact, much more um, uh, income inequality remediation, uh, mitigation. The Nordics, of course, way up the top left. Um, Australia and Canada closest to us, but in each case doing more. Uh, and it's the size of the system that drives the results because it's the spending side that dominates. So the United States, and these are all taxes, including state and local. The United States, low, this is tax as a percentage of GDP, the same vertical axis as before. The United States just has a smaller system and, and at the same time does less by way of uh, uh, mitigating income inequality. Germany, which is my uh, comparable here throughout, um, is way up because it has a larger fiscal system. It just has a larger base. Even though it's a regressive one, it's doing more. Uh, and large systems, in turn, simply aren't progressive by nature because there are all of these costs to super high marginal income tax returns. So the United States, progressive. Germany, regressive. But Germany, the vertical axis here is now the size of the system. 
Germany, a much larger system. Larger systems, even though they're regressive when measured in the abstract, provide the resources for super progressive spending, and that super progressive spending dominates the tax side and leads to progressive fiscal outcomes. So I'll stop there. I thought I would um, start where you just ended, um, which is this notion that a progressive tax system is not the same thing as a progressive system. A progressive fiscal system, yes, sir. And how, so, so two questions. One, what are the two things that you would say the Congress should do to improve the progressivity of the system? And then the second is, you know, what's the communication that's necessary to get people to be much more sensitized to the fact that tax is only one side of the government equation exactly. and that there's a government, there's a spending piece as well. Yeah. Congress needs to um, uh, adopt a, a philosophy of um, a commitment to investment, to invest in ourselves through education, to invest in infrastructure, which has these, you know, uh, 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 knock-on uh, positive uh, consequences of, of jobs and the like, uh, 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 to invest in pure research, uh, uh, because that in fact will fund the, uh, 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 create the environment for uh, uh, future innovation. So we need for a Congress to appreciate the importance of investment at every level. Uh, uh, including in ourselves and um, in particular appreciating the importance of uh, investing uh, in education uh, as a way of honoring uh, equality of opportunity. Uh, the purpose of the book is in fact to reorient people's thinking in exactly these lines and um, I failed to sell a million copies so um, all I can do is to keep talking and encourage others to do so and to write op-eds and the like. And I actually think that one of the mistakes that academics make is they think that uh, the extent to which they are withdrawn from the quotidian world uh, is, a, is, a, is a signifier of their academic merit. Uh, and it's, the world is, I think, I think that's absolutely inappropriate in the modern world. Uh, we live in a world dominated by blogs, and uh, the other forms of commentary. Uh, as academics, we need to engage in that world. Uh, if we're in the social sciences sphere in the, in the broadest sense, and if we want to change the world in our lifetimes, I think it's particularly incumbent on uh, the law academy. I think you know, uh, we should have a predilection for action um, and rather than congratulating on ourselves on our distance from the quotidian world. Well, I would say it's not just localized to law. I mean, we're on a, we're on a college campus, and you know, as a faculty member, I don't get incentives to, I don't face incentives to get out and be public and do all those sorts right. of now, things. Right, I've had a wonderfully supportive dean, which has you know, made all of this possible. Um, uh, but the academy, more broadly, is, is doesn't not. value that, right? It, the, absolutely the, not. And, and, and so for Joe, Joe Bankman um, at Stanford and Paul Caron at, at Pepperdine just have a new paper uh, on this, in fact, uh, sort of uh, chastising the uh, Tax Law Academy for its removal from uh, uh, the world of policy. But I also want to get back to your indictment of economics. No, uh, no, not economics. It's, you know, some economists who, no, who are running for public but office. Broad, but no, yeah. not, not just necessarily running for, for public office. Right. I mean, the field of economics has an approach to policy that um, is somewhat arm's length from the reality of institutions. Yes. And it doesn't face its, its underlying moral ideologies. Right? There are assumptions embedded yes. in. Well, the, I would say the moral consequences of their assumptions. Sure, right? sure. Yeah. Um, Trying to be nicer to them. And so, so I actually think that, that, that what you're saying um, is, is a more general malady, <coughs> and it allows the, the discourse to. Um, have these unintended consequences yes. um, because it's not as grounded in real things. Right. The, the patronizing tone of a lot of uh, um, uh, economists work when they venture into the lay uh, uh, sphere of things um, is, is, is very distressing and uh, their unwillingness uh, to, to acknowledge the, um, uh, the, the 
the implicate the moral uh, philosophy implications uh, of many of their standard assumptions is uh, uh, something that really needs uh, some introspection on their part. So I'm a little, I have to say when I was listening to you, I felt a little chastised myself because That's I use the word redistribution all the time, right? Uh, in, in my public finance lesson, lesson, I try to emphasize that a market outcome is not necessarily the efficient outcome. Uh, the market doesn't guarantee everyone a living wage. It doesn't do a lot of things. It doesn't guarantee everyone will have enough clothes or enough food or any of those sorts of things. Right. And you've got to redistribute the funds to get us to that Pareto optimal situation where everyone winds up being better. Uh, if I'm not supposed to use that phrase or that word, what's, what's the word I should be saying? Social investment. Social investment. It's different because redistribution implies, you don't mind if I answer? No, this, go this, ahead. This, I, I mean, I this wise guy? Okay, so, um, uh, uh, so Dan, the redistribution is, is different because first it, it, it um, uh, enfranchises the baseline market distribution as, as somehow the norm from which things are being redistributed. And second, because it creates a, the zero sum sort of Robin Hood, you know, take from the rich, give to the poor kind of framing, which ignores the fact that social investment creates a bigger pie, throws off actual positive economic returns. Redistribution takes all of that and, and, and just um, throws it off the table. But can I get, this? so this touches on something that I don't know what the answer is, but it troubles me as a potentially significant hurdle. Yes, sir. Right, so, so this idea that there is a significant comp luck component to success. Yes. Right? That, that kind of flies in the face of the American exceptionalism narrative yes. or the idea that you know, hard work is all that you need and you can succeed. Uh, do you think, I mean, and that is yes. deeply embedded in yes. sort of the American psyche. Yes. Right? You're saying blow, are you, we're saying blow that up, right? That, I mean, as, as I'm hearing you, I mean, is that really feasible? Well, you, it's, a, it's a very a fair question. I, I don't, uh, I, tr I try to um, duck it in the sense that if you really uh, wanted to um, uh, actualize the, the point that outcomes are very, very contingent, you would in fact adopt very high, very, very high marginal tax rates and many, you know, um, on the theory that, hey, you're just lucky, at least lucky as you are hardworking. Uh, and I don't do that uh, uh, because you can't uh, reinvent a national psyche overnight. And that's why I try to use terms like social investment. That's why I try to emphasize the theme of investment and insurance and say that, look, this is just a sensible insurance program. And my joke in the book, my, the, so the dime store rolls, is to say, uh, uh, that uh, we're all intelligent, uh, non-corporeal beings lined up. We've all made this very bizarre decision, which Rawls kind of skips over, which is we've decided to leave this very cushy, non-corporeal <laughs> plane uh, and enter uh, the, 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 the human condition, uh, knowing that most people have really shitty lives, and yet we've agreed to do this. So, but at least having made this, what seems to me, being supremely rational, non-corporeal beings uh, behind the veil, making this fundamentally irrational decision, uh, uh, you would think as we line up, you know, you'd say right before you'd sort of jump out of the astral plane uh, into the human condition, you'd say, shit, I'd better buy some insurance. Uh, and, and then you'd say, but, you know, I'm, I'm non I don't have any pockets, much less money. I'm just a non-corporeal being here behind the veil. And then you say, that's what um, the progressive income tax, to the extent you want to ex have a principal justification for it, is that you're paying in arrears for the insurance that you bought uh, 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 before uh, you entered the human condition. Uh, uh, and you, since you can't pay in advance, like you do normally with insurance, you're paying in arrears through the progressive income tax. Uh, uh, to me, that's a, a, a rational uh, justification for uh, progressive tax. But then the idea is that the money is being spent in ways uh, that uh, are insurance payoffs to those with uh, 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 fortuitous uh, uh, adverse events. 
So imagine if you thought of taxes as an insurance policy, paying off everybody else so they won't take away your money. No. Same. And so I suspect your say you raise the taxes on where you know, say proportional to wealth or something, it probably has a very low tax rate, um, insurance cost per person. In other words, you're paying very low insurance so that there is a society where property rights are honored rather than thought to be après moi de the use or you know. Right. So and I think that's an interesting people, in other words, economists in particular, assume there's a government, there's a stability. That's very expensive. We know that. If yes. you don't sort of buy off enough people, you don't have it. And so I'm willing to let them uh, market, but first of all, buy me a stable society. I, look, I, the second point is extremely powerful, and with one which I absolutely agree, that uh, you cannot assume uh, the rule of law. You cannot assume clearly developed, articulated, and enforced property rights. Uh, those are expensive, and they uh, are the investments of centuries, centuries of, of investment, you know, figuring out what the hell did we mean by entail after, you know, or, or enfeoffment or what. You know. So absolutely, uh, absolutely right. The book... Uh, notwithstanding, you know, my apople uh, not apoplectic, but uh, apocalyptic tone today, the book tries to tell an optimistic story. And I think a story of you rich folk uh, should buy us off is not the optimist. I want to tell a story about growth. I want to tell a story about America being a richer, happier place, uh, not one in, in which um, uh, the uh, underclass uh, is has been kept under control. So Finally, the third last point: uh, the rich are already doing exactly what you describe because the rich live in gated communities. The rich have withdrawn to a large extent uh, from interaction with you in Ralphs um, or Vons or wherever you do your shopping, uh, and so b they've in effect bought their insurance by buying into the gated communities and so on. So and you're looking at the redistributive impact in Europe or yes. other OECD countries. It's a snapshot. It's not lifetime. Yes. And something I struggle with is on the whole issue of college education. Yeah. Is on the one hand, if you look at the lifetime income of people with college education, it's considerably higher than the lifetime income of those who don't have college education. Yes, sir. So if we tax people, particularly in an unprogressive way, to fund free college, over the life cycle, that seems to me like a regressive transfer, not a progressive transfer. And that worries me. And, and it's a big deal. You know, this is a big chunk of money. This is a yeah. trivial thing. Am I thinking about this the wrong well, way? Well, I think you are, because what other opportunity is there for low in, you know, lower income smart kids to, in fact, have the same equality of opportunity? And, you know, if you look at Canada, for example, um, I don't know a lot about the Canadian education system, but uh, Miles Korak, the, the book has lots of, of um, uh, uh, you know, analysis of inequality um, uh, done through panel uh, data. Miles Korak's done some really interesting stuff um, uh, comparing the U.S. and Canada, for example. Uh, where they have lower, I don't remember exactly how it works, but lower university costs. Uh, and it turns out that they have uh, uh, much less um, uh, uh, frozen kinds of inequality. We like to think that there's a great deal of turnover in um, our inequality measures, that it's just a snapshot, but it's not true. It's sticky. And it's much stickier than in Canada, and it's much stickier than in the OECD countries. So if the, if, if, if the concern is um, uh, uh, whether um, uh, the uh, accomplishments of the parent are transmitted like quasi-gene to the child, the United States comes out at the bottom in the studies uh, in, in, in along that metric. No, I understand. I just think uh, that the, the free college in Germany thing yeah. seems to me to be giving a very large benefit to people who, over their life cycle, will make more money than the people who don't take the benefit. And if it's a fairly small share of people who go to college in Germany, I, mean, I don't remember the number right now, but they said a lot more school. And so right. on. So it's so sort of like cross subsidy right. programs right. make a lot. So why kids of rich parents shouldn't pay $50,000? I have no problem. I have no problem amending 
It, it, my interest, and the book has been criticized at, fairly in the following respect, which is I spend a lot more time trying to build up the, the middle class and the poor than I spend trying to knock down the rich. And um, but people have criticized me from the left as being uh, too easy on the affluent. So I, I take that criticism that, you know, there's no reason why the affluent shouldn't pay. I'm fine with that. But my concern is that the smart kid from a lower income environment should have this comparable investment and it's got to come from the public sector. So I, and I take, it's a fair criticism that people from the left have said, I, I, don't, I, I don't seem to have a, as, a much, as much hunger for punishing the rich as uh, uh, my, uh, uh, Jeremiah tone would suggest. Dan. Why should we be caring so much about the smart low income kid? Um. No, I, that's fair. And I don't mean to, I actually don't mean to suggest. I apologize. That, in respect of university, I think that's the relevant question. Uh, I think that not everyone, as I said, I, I don't know if you were here, uh, you know, not everyone's going to be a Snapchat, you know, not everyone's going to be a software engineer in Silicon Valley. Uh, so we need good quality jobs. We need to have a path by which the median uh, male worker's income is going up over time. And the way we're going to do that, I think, is by uh, collectively investing uh, in ourselves. You need only drive the streets of Los Angeles to see billions of dollars of infrastructure opportunities waiting for you. I can give you a list. Uh, and it drives me crazy. The book talks about some of these comparisons, you know, um, uh, whether it's, you know, the, you just, I like to use the UK because uh, the current UK government is uh, not a big spending kind of government. But the Crossrail project is uh, something in the order of $18 billion project to get, you know, rail service underneath London so that you can actually get from one end of London to the other. Uh, we can't build a, th a, a third railroad tunnel between Manhattan and the mainland of America. Because, oh, it would cost a billion dollars. Where would we get that? So, so that's how you create good quality jobs. You, gotta, in, you have to be, think about what different opportunities, what opportunity set best um, brings out the full potential of each individual. I, you know, I don't think university is the answer for everybody personally. But. This is a concern, right? In that you're talking about how the rich have already essentially receded from any right. sort of notion of a public sphere. And if we don't have any sort of level of political unity, how do we then say that we have to have these investments to be a better... Well, that's the great thing about democracy is, you, you know, uh, we can outvote them. Uh, so what we need is a much more engaged polity, and it is very surprising. To, I, I yell at my son, who's uh, the age of uh, graduate students or law students, uh, uh, give or take. Uh, I yell at him all the time. I say, you know, why aren't you, you know, at the barricades? What's the matter with you people? Um, uh, why, did, you know, why didn't you shut the university down? And uh, at every level, that we've collectively withdrawn. The rich have physically, literally withdrawn. <laughs> uh, uh, they, they, uh, they live in a very parallel world. I, you know, I, I spent a lot of time with rich folk. But, but we've collectively withdrawn. As democracy, though, in a, in a universe where we've got fragmented millions of people who do not necessarily see the point of engagement because they don't see, essentially, as government as being part of making their lives better. Right, that's why it's a very lonely mission that God gave me. Okay. You have to... <laughs> one by one convince people that government is simply, is different, is not the same as simply uh, burning your money. That government in fact has use, and because government can be useful, you should invest the time to try and help make government useful. And that is a lonely mission. <laughs> so I'm just wondering, in terms of thinking about how progressive is the whole system, I think one of the challenges, and part of the reason there's not a lot of research, is because a lot of government spending is hard to place a value. I mean, there's a lot of research that says an in, a dollar of in-kind transfer isn't necessarily valued as much as a dollar of unrestricted cash. Um, so, so here's what CBO did in their first cut, okay? and. I'm not suggesting it's easy. That's why I'm not doing it. That's why I'm trying to get you to do it. So what CBO did in its first cut was um, to assume, uh, and the, the, the standard assumption that, that a dollar 
of spending has a dollar of value. Uh, so the transfer payments are valued at phase. They all have somebody's name on the check, conceptually. Uh, and then they took the remaining um, government spending, which is 40-ish you know, percent of government spending, uh, and they allocated it under, uh, to all of us under different methodologies, assuming valuing it dollar for dollar. So they didn't, they didn't say that this money was as good as thrown away. Uh, and you know, one was per capita, another was in, in proportion to income, and in, in, in so on, uh, and see you know, what the outcomes were. And, and those are very rudimentary first cuts. But to me, the most remarkable fact is that the first cut was 2013, or maybe late 2012, not, not 1982. And so you can do better than that. So I'm looking forward to, to your paper. <laughs> well, it would be I was thinking it would be interesting to see um, some of these cross-country comparisons, yeah. right? these countries that have bigger public sectors. If you factored in even a rough cut of that kind of stuff, do those cross-country comparisons change in terms of? Right. So I couldn't find good cross-country data, including, I, I do have one slide where OECD did this for a while but I couldn't find out exactly what their underlying method are. So I do, in the book, have um, one chart where uh, OECD, um, uh, in fact, uh, distributed all spending, not just uh, transfer payments. It didn't change things very much, uh, but uh, you know, the, the, the rough orders of magnitude were the same. But it's, it, it, there, is, there is a chart in the book, so you can compare the two. And we're just about out of time, um, but um, Ed, this has really been wonderful. Well, so, thank you, Raphael. You, know, you, st you started by chastising me about <laughs> misstating the book, so I'll make sure I say it right at the end. <laughs> uh, but the imagery of you as an Old Testament prophet walking through the wilderness <laughs> with the staff, lonely on your way, um, is, is actually quite compelling. Um, <laughs> but, but I actually don't think it's true, because I think that there's a lot in this book that's going to uh, lead to a lot of people be following behind you and well, trying to get you, some of this stuff going. Thank you very much. Uh, the book is, we're better than this, uh, uh, How Government Should Spend Our Money. Uh, Ed will be around for a little while. If you want a copy of the book uh, and you want him to sign it, uh, there's a table set up in the back. Um, and thank you all for being thank here. You. Yes, Hopefully, thank you. Hopefully, you um, you'll stay in the loop on Bedrosian Center activities and events. Um, and there, we, all, we try to always keep them at this level. So really high quality. Uh, well thought out, very articulate folks who uh, can lead us to think hard about some things and why things are the way they are. Uh, so with that, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Okay.